Welcome to the Customer Academy channel. My name is Neil Benson. My guest in this episode is Richard Hundhausen. He's from Boise in Idaho in the US. He's a professional scrum trainer and a DevOps trainer. And as you'll hear, Richard doesn't have a background in Dynamics 365 or Power Platform, but he's no stranger to developing apps on Microsoft technology. In fact, he was a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies for 14 years and a Microsoft Regional Director. He's recently published a book, Professional Scrum Development with Azure DevOps. Richard was the second professional scrum trainer at scrum.org, and he's the co-creator of the Nexus Scaled Scrum Framework. We have a fascinating discussion covering uh, the use of scrum, like when to use it, how to scale scrum and when to scale it, uh, how to find product owners when you're building business applications, uh, discuss the merits of big bang releases versus incremental releases, product thinking versus project thinking, and even when it's a good idea to have a project manager when you're using Scrum. Richard is full of great stories and very practical advice. I hope you enjoy this episode as much as I did. Here's Richard Hundhausen. So I'm here today with Richard Hundhausen. Welcome, Richard, to the Amazing Applications Podcast. It's great to have you on the show. Hey, thanks, Neil. Finally get a chance to talk to you. I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, you too. So let me, uh, for the folks that don't know you, let me give you a quick introduction and build you up here. And then we're going to dive into your origin story and find out a lot more. But you're in Boise, Idaho, is that right? Boise, Idaho, yeah. We're in the yeah. Pacific Northwest of the US. So what time is it for you at the moment? You're going to make me look that up. It's uh, one thirty-five in the afternoon on a... Okay. Oh, that's pretty on civil. A, uh, it's uh, Thursday. So it's yeah. what, down there. It's Friday already. Uh, that's right. It's Friday here. I'm from the future. It's 6.35 in the morning. Uh, right. Uh, and you're a professional Scrum trainer. You're a DevOps expert as well and co-creator of um, Scrum.org's Nexus uh, Scale Framework, which I love to dive into. And your own, your own business, I believe. Uh, Sentient, is that how I say it? Yep, Accentient uh, started with a business partner back in the early 2000s, primarily around training and consulting on software development, app lifecycle management. And then uh, I, I got the company in uh, 2006. And since then, DevOps and Scrum since about 2009. Great. And you were a Microsoft MVP in developer technologies for the longest time and a Microsoft regional director as well. So. Yeah, correct. I've, I've, I've been a software developer. I don't want to say this out loud, but gosh, since the seventies, getting paid for it since the eighties and found that in the nineties, it's kind of a nice break now and then to stop and teach a class. So I found that I had a knack to teach software developers, new tools, new frameworks, new languages, because it turns out, Neil, that the secret to teaching software developers is just tell them what they don't know. Don't tell them anything they already know. <laughs> Give them lots of sample code, places to go to get their questions answered, like a Stack Overflow, uh, some some repos on GitHub, and then just shut up and let them play with things. Cool. So the, the trick there is knowing what they don't already know. Knowing uh, what they don't before, before know. they step into your class, yeah. Which is really hard in the virtual world. In, in in the in person world, you can see that like question mark floating over their heads, but when the cameras are off, you've got no idea if they're getting it or not. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. So just before we get started, what are the things? I'd like to know more about it because I think I heard in another podcast, you've got five kids at home. So I'd love to know what your favorite Lego set or Lego theme is. Favorite Lego set. Well, we have so many Legos. We've, we've got probably three or four of the large bins full of just raw Legos. <laughs> uh, but also my boys got all the Star Wars ones up on shelves and we got uh, a nice cool Vespa scooter for my girls. Oh, so, nice. Yeah, we're doing lots of Legos in this house and I'd say probably uh, the big Millennium Falcon was my favorite. Oh, I haven't got the Millennium Falcon yet. It's uh, it's on my list. Very cool. Um, I love illustrating my Scrum presentations with Lego minifigures. So we've got mm. Wonder Woman as a product owner. She a lot of my great product owners that I've ever worked with have all been women. So we've got Wonder Woman as our product owner. Uh, nice. Superman is the Scrum Master because the initials match, and then we got lots of other superheroes in the team as well. So. Um, oh, that's awesome. It's, uh, it's been fun. Quick story. Uh, sprints, jump, jumping right into Scrum here, because that's how my brain works. Sorry, you, you, you invited me on here. You get the whole package. <laughs> uh, Two-week sprints, 26 of them in a year. 
what else has 26 things in it? The alphabet. Right. I don't, I don't know if, if the Australian alphabet has 26 letters. I'm guessing <laughs> it, it does. Uh, so I've worked with some teams before that instead of Sprint 1, Sprint 2, Sprint 3, they went through the alphabet and they named them after superheroes. So we're going Ooh, into... 26 different superheroes, each beginning with a different letter. Yes, and it's, it can be done. Wikipedia to the rescue. And on, <laughs> on odd years, they went with supervillains. So I happened to be right. there, I think, in, in 2020, 2019, and we were arguing whether Venom was a supervillain or a superhero. And I think I think ended up being a villain, so it fit the bill. But right. yeah, I love the superhero themes. It works. Yeah, cool. So tell me about your Scrum origin and how you got started with Scrum. And also, your I'd love to hear how the MVP award weaved into that as well. So tell us how you got started. So I've been a Microsoft fanboy since the mid 90s, you know, Visual Basic uh, 4, Visual Basic 5, Visual Basic 6, SQL Server 6, 6, 6.5, 6, 6 didn't last very long, 6.5 came out because the internet came out and there was the internet connectors and all that was SQL. So I was a, I was a VB SQL developer and a VB SQL instructor, Microsoft certified trainer since about 96 and enjoyed it, enjoyed it. And I stayed very tight with the Visual Studio product and product group. Um, in 2004, I'd written, I'd co-authored a couple of study guides for the VB certification test back in the late 90s. And then I just approached Microsoft Press and said, hey, I'd be interested in writing a book on Visual Studio 2003 Enterprise Architect Edition. It's $10,000. Everyone's buying it. They don't even know what they're getting. I'd love it. I'd love to write a book that says, hey, you just spent a bunch of money. Let me tell you what it does. And they came back and said, no, we'd rather you write a book on Visio. <laughs> I said, I don't, I don't want to write a book on Visio. They said, well, we, the office group's got lots of money. Uh, you know, you can just jump right in and write us a book on Visio. <laughs> what? Any, any tool that can help model your databases and also help you landscape your backyard is just not for me. It's just too, <laughs> too versatile. Um, so he said, well, hold on a second. I just heard about something code named Burton, like Burton snowboards. Uh, let me get back to you. So this was uh, 2004, I think it was. Turns out Burton was the code name for a team foundation server. Oh, here we go. Microsoft yeah. had hired Brian Harry. He brought SourceSafe over. SourceSafe kind of morphed into, uh, you know, fused with, with, with Source Depot and some of the other internal tools. And they came out with this offering, I think in part to compete with Rational that was just purchased by IBM back then. Yeah. So uh, Codename Burton ended up becoming Team Foundation Server 2005, the first edition, first version. And then the ALM tools, back then it was called SDLC in Visual Studio. There was the test edition and the architect edition and the, you know, the, the database edition, the data dude. So I hung out with the SDLC tools. You know, I, I created courseware. I would doing talks at tech eds on, on TFS and customizing it. And, and as you know, when you're talking about tools, process naturally comes into it. You know, there's, there's, there's right ways and wrong ways to work as a team with the tools that you're using. So I, I gravitated toward agile. I'd heard about it. I'd learned XP in the late nineties, hadn't really worked with any teams doing XP, but started running into more and more teams doing scrum. So in about 2007, I found myself, you know, talking about how to do scrum and TFS, right? Use some of the, you know, the scrum for team system templates that were out there and actually helped Microsoft create the current scrum process in Azure DevOps in 2010. So that led to a phone call in 2009 from Ken Schwaber, co-creator of scrum said, yeah. Hey, uh, did you happen to read, can't draw drawing a blank here, ThoughtWorks, Australian guy, come on, help me out here. Martin Fowler. Martin Fowler, yeah, okay. I can't believe I forgot Martin Fowler. Sorry, Martin, if you're listening to this, and I know you're not. Uh, <laughs> Martin Fowler wrote a blog post simply titled Flaccid Scrum. Ooh. People are going and taking the two-day class. They're bringing their ticket back. Look, I'm a shiny new CSM, and nothing's changing. No, no software is getting done. You know, releases are delayed, yada, yada. So Ken said, we need to address this by going at the developer, not the Scrum Master, but the developer and the development team. Because back then it was still called the development team. This was pre-Scrum Guide, right? I think the Scrum Guide was just really? coming out. So I call this the dark ages of Scrum because Scrum was whatever you learned in the last class from the Scrum trainer that you had or Ken's last book that you happened to flip through and 
right. gosh, was it called an event or was it called a ceremony? Was it, was it called a, you know, stand up or a daily scrum? And it was like, there's been a few changes the, of terminology. Yeah, exactly. And the terminology being all mixed up made it hard to really lock in on what was and what is not scrum. So I started working with Ken, we, we mapped out what a, what a scrum developer program training and certification would look like. Ken fell apart with Scrum Alliance. There's a whole story there. I want to get into that. It's it's available on scrum.org to some degree if you want to read about the origins of scrum.org. But scrum.org, you know, rose out of the ashes, replacing certified scrum with professional scrum. Professional scrum. Yeah. And that's scrum according to the scrum guide with a focus on empiricism and a focus on the scrum values and a focus on continuous improvement, which you can't do scrum without all of those and like yep. what some people I've, I've done both my CSM with the folks over at Scrum Alliance nice. and professional Scrum Master as well. So uh, a foot in both camps. Um, yeah, these days yeah. Uh, I, I prefer Scrum.org's focus and, and their mission. So focusing on that, on that stuff. So yeah, it's nice to cool. hear that. So yeah, 2010 ish, uh, I was a professional Scrum trainer. I was the first PST, you know, aside from Ken, who as soon as he had the idea in his head, he became PST number one because. Yeah. Ken Schwaber. Uh, and it's been a good ride, you know, professional scrum. I, I don't teach all the classes. I'm, I'm probably not your guy for product owner. I'm probably not your guy for, you know, some of the UX stuff, but I love developer. I love scaling. I love, of course, the intro class, uh, Kanban, and to, to some degree, the scrum master bits. Mm. So I'm, I'm fascinated because I haven't taken the professional scrum developer course or certification yet. Mm. I have taken a professional scrum master and professional product owner. There's about 80% overlap in those two courses. They're both very introductory to scrum. There's a bit more of an emphasis on, on the backlog, on refinement, on prioritization mm -hmm. for product owners in the, in the PSPO class, as you might imagine. What's in the developer course that you wouldn't learn as a, as a scrum master in the PSM course? Where's, sure. where's the focus? Yeah, it's a, so it's the only three day class scrum org offers. And it's essentially an immersion into Scrum. There's three or four sprints where you're actually on a, on a technical team, working in code, using your own IDEs of choice, using your own pipelines and all that if you want to set it up. We have a common case study with, I think, 10 different languages. So, and we can even mix it up in class. I've, I've run classes recently where we've had two Java teams, a C-sharp team, you know, and over here is a, a Python team. And they can all have the same backlog and they all have kind of the same ish starter code to uh to bring to to bring to market oh, but very cool we're learning topics in in in, in the psd program it, it's now called aps sd it's applying professional scrum for software development but the certification is still called psd professional scrum developer and we're learning things in there how to meet the definition of done uh how to, how to work as a team uh considering writing tests first all the classic XP things come to bear, right? Oh, right. Okay. So more, more of the technical practices, a lot of which are borrowed from, from XP, right? Oh, yeah. And that's because yeah. they work. I'm, I'm a huge fan of XP. I just would prefer them sitting as complementary practices on top of Scrum, as opposed to just doing all the bits of XP. Yeah, cool. Um, that's very cool. When we think about applying Scrum to Microsoft business applications, one of the challenges I have the community has is scrum isn't always the right choice of framework or approach because a business application can be a complex mission critical enterprise application that it takes a big team of people many years to to deploy uh, or it can be a simple productivity app that i can build for my team in a couple of days and so that we run the gamut from very simple up to extremely complex and scrum i i believe is great at helping me understand, break down, iterate on complex work. And it's maybe an overkill approach for simple work, straightforward work, where the requirements are pretty well known, where I have a good idea of what the solution is going to be before I start mm -hmm. building it. Um, and teams don't quite know where to apply Scrum. Where, where's What's a good set of criteria that I should check before starting a new project with a new team going, let's use the Scrum framework as our approach for this project. What are your guidelines for helping a team decide when to adopt Scrum? That is a good question. It's not an easy one to answer. I actually wrote a blog post a few years ago for scrum.org. I can get you and put it in the show notes. But, you know, I just go down through a series of questions, maybe ask five or six questions. 
And if, if the majority of the answers are yes, I would suggest Scrum. Uh, first of all, I'm, I'm not one of these, hey, let's do Scrum for everything. Let's get all of the accountants in the, bu in the building following you know, Scrum and doing sprints. Uh, I have met organizations that every department is on the same sprint so that the CEO can feel good about we're all goal oriented and on the same cadence here. But you, you got to wonder if some of the departments are just going crazy. <laughs> Swing uphill. Um, right. So some of the questions I would ask is number one, are we building a product? You know, and, and I don't know how it is with your clients, but I am constantly trying to get them to switch from project minded thinking to product minded thinking. Right. I said, you can, you can keep the project thinking. We're just going to start calling them sprints. Okay. Uh, it's a time box, you know, period of time that has a goal that you can work on items that you want to in that little mini project. But are we building a product? And I'm, I'm a software person. So primarily I'm working with software teams and it's pretty easy to figure out what the product is there. Although not always, sometimes you have to ask the users or the code base or the developers and you might get different answers as to what the product is. Right. So there's actually some workshops I've, I've led to start as broad as possible and narrow down. It could be that the organization itself is the product. I know that sounds weird, but most banks, for example, no matter what we're doing, the product is an account, just yep. kind of account, you know, whether it's a, a loan account or a savings account or whatever. So are you doing product development? You know, if you're just trying to do a, a list of work, that may or may not be complex. That's great. But are you building an increment? Can, can I take the work from sprint five? And is it additive to the work I'm going to do in sprint six? So that's a yes. What's one yes? So two, do you have a minimum number of technical people? You know, the, the old scrum guys were pretty cool. You needed at least three people, you know, to, to, to be on the team, at least three developers. So I, I still kind of use that as a rule of thumb. If it's just okay. you, you know, and, you, and you're working on a product in your garage, I don't think you need Scrum if you're just a team of one or two people. Um, you can just talk to each other. You can know in real time what the risks are. So, you know, it, it, but if you have more than 10, which is the kind of the new upper limit of the Scrum team, you can still do Scrum. You just might might have a couple different teams. Yep. So I've, I've worked at both extremes. I've worked on a Scrum team with two de uh, was one developer to start with, then it became two. Mm -hmm. It was a little, it felt very odd. It kind of worked. Mm -hmm but it did feel strange. Um, and there was reasons why we wanted to use Scrum because we wanted to set, you know, is it, uh, it's all about educating the organization. Other bigger teams are gonna adopt Scrum. We were kind of a pilot. And then I've run other projects other, or built other products where you know, we, we were at the upper limit and I had to split into multiple teams. And that's uh, an interesting challenge we'll get into as well. You've got some expertise there. Um, so those are a couple of good tests. Anything else that, that people should check themselves? So the, the, the work itself is, is the work itself like big enough and complex enough that you need a team of people to work on it. And this, this is where I don't, I don't know when it comes to the, the low code, no code business apps world. If you, if you really need two or three people working on these features, you know, creating this capability and maybe you do, um, you know, I get asked a lot, Hey, should we use scrum on our, uh, SAP system. I'm like, well, I don't, what do you develop in SAP? Well, sometimes we'll like upload some new like forms to type into or something. And then yep. we run through some sample data. I'm like, well, that sounds kind of like code and test. So maybe, but it also might be overkill. If, if it's all stuff that one person can do in four hours and you're done, gosh, I don't know that you need scrum for that. Yep. So, so we, we have um, the work. We definitely have, low code, no code folks who've got expertise in, in composing business applications rather than you know, cracking open Visual Studio and, and developing things from scratch. Um, but we're trying to create such a, a large volume that we have three or four of those people in our teams. And we still need to analyze the requirement a little bit, design which components are going on, how they're going to work together. And we need to test them and validate that they work and, and verify that they can be deployed into production. And, and we still need developers there to to help us when we reach the limit of what the low code application builders can do. And we can extend that with custom code and we need to integrate uh, with other systems or okay. migrate data. And quite often a code first approach is quicker than a no code approach when it comes to integration and data migration. So um, yeah, we, we've got these 
uh, fusion teams composed of lots of different skills, um, just like any other software development team, I think. Okay. Yeah. So it sounds like you've got a pretty well set up cross-functional team and, and work that requires that. And then one, one final one I was just thinking of is, is the, is, is the majority of the work plannable? Do you, do you have a backlog? Do you have a product goal you're trying to chase down that you can take concrete steps towards with, with sprints? Or is it just coming at you like, Hey, fix this bug. Hey, here's an outage. Hey, do this custom script real quick for the boss, you know? Yeah. Or is it, is it, is it plannable work? So the majority of the work you have is plannable. Uh, it's complex. You're building a product. You've got enough people. I'd say, you know, let's party on and do scrum. Cool. I've worked on a couple of products where we've done several releases in the production. We're all live, all the users are happy. And now we're transitioning into, into kind of a support environment. And, and we've yeah. tried to keep going as a scrum team, but it just doesn't work. We're, the work is not plannable, right? We're, or we're, we're just dealing with how many of these bugs can we get fixed in the next sprint? Well, what's our sprint goal? Uh, it's to fix these bugs. Like, oh, uh, it's not yeah. really a sprint goal. We're beginning to fall apart. And so exactly. we transition into Kanban at that point. And Which is unfortunate because you've work. got a, it sounds like you got a well-oiled machine there. You should, you know, get a different product, different product backlog and keep, keep rolling. Keep rolling, you know, yeah. You could still make some space in your sprints for supporting the old system. But, you know, I, I, I talk about this. Once you become a high performance professional scrum team, man, don't, don't disband it. Don't break it up like little seedlings and try to plant them in other teams. Keep them, keep them together, keep them happy, keep them fed with, with, high quality work, you know, in the backlog. Yeah. So what, what tends to happen in our world is that a Microsoft customer will hire us to build this application. Um, we end up becoming a high performing scrum team. We're, we're all working together. We've been there for a year or two and mm -hmm. it's gone really well, but the customer has achieved their goal of, of developing this application, releasing it into production. They're, they've maybe got some of their own team now supporting it. Mm -hmm. And as a Microsoft partner, I want to take my great performing scrum team and just go find another customer with a similar challenge and plunk them down there and do the same again for somebody else. In, yeah, exactly. In a similar industry with a similar challenge um, and keep that team together. And that's what I've been able to do for the last uh, four years for three or four different customers is take the same scrum team that I've got and, uh, nice. and we just keep rolling. Uh, and, uh, yeah, so you yeah, know what I'm talking, talking about. about. You want to just keep that, keep that rhythm, keep that flow. Right. Yeah. And when we think about what's our definition of done, well, let's, let's take a look at the one that we've used the last three years. Do we need to yeah, tweak exactly. it for this environment, for this customer, for this challenge? Oh yeah. Let's add a couple of extra criteria to our definition of done. How do we think about our DevOps approach here? Well, they want to manage their environments in this way and they want to use, um, we used Octopus deploy over here, but here we're going to use it as your DevOps. So similar sure. kind of pipelines, but we're just going to use a different tech. Yeah. You got a good, you got a good thing going there. I wish more yeah. companies would, would, would get that. Thinking about that inter interplay between Scrum and DevOps, there's some people saying we don't need Scrum anymore. DevOps is the future. It's um, it's a culture as well as a set of tools and technologies, and we we can just focus on continuous integration, continuous development, and a couple of extra technical practices, you know, TDD and those things. Mm -hmm. And let's not bother with with Scrum, but focus on on DevOps as an approach instead. Is there any validity to that? Kind of. I, I hear it. The other direction as well. Um, right. First thing is, I always say is, what is the definition of DevOps? You know, everyone's got a different definition. Is it, it's the union of Dev and Ops. I'm like, <laughs> okay, most of my clients can't even get Dev and Test together yet. Why are we jumping ahead to Ops? So I like Donovan Brown. He was the sort of chief evangelist of Azure DevOps at Microsoft. I'm not sure what he's doing these days, but it was the, you've heard of people process tools. That's, that's a right. common alliteration. Uh, well, he made it more of an alliteration, people, product, process, and products, because also Microsoft sells products uh, to, to enable the continuous delivery of value to the users. And I'm like, gosh, that sounds like Scrum. So back in 2010, 2011, when the, when the D word started emerging, I'm like, this is just professional Scrum with specific XP practices that the team chooses and, it, and, and kind of an adherence to technical excellence, yeah, which is in the Agile manifesto. There's nothing new about technical excellence. I, personally, I think S Scrum and XP and, and people and culture is hard to change, as you know. So I think there was a whole movement to like, well, let's just go get tools to solve it for us. So to me, DevOps sounds like tool vendors are here to save the day. Yeah. If I just buy Jira, it'll all be okay. Just buy Jira or just buy Microsoft. I mean, we're, we're fanboys, but we got to admit that 
they they did a cool thing. They stuck Azure and DevOps in the name. So you're like, oh, <laughs> yeah, that's, wow. that's so smart. This is maybe you have a few disenchanted Amazon people going, oh, I'm not going to use Azure DevOps, but then they figure out that it works pretty well for them or GCP or whatever. One more thing is if you look at the three ways of DevOps, that's that's just Scrum. You know, one is 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 short establishing and shortening those feedback loops. So not just time to market, but you know, cycle time and fast feedback, fail fast, all those things we do in Scrum. Then then also, you know, getting that feedback back so that the product owner and, and, and the Scrum team can can work on it, as well as enabling a, a culture of learning. That's the Scrum values, that's this the retrospectives and you know, focus on continuous improvement. So when I hear DevOps, I think this is professional Scrum with XP and technical excellence. Hmm. I'm not sure and if I, I answered your question. And a, and a product underneath that just to help us manage our work, right? So. Sure. But honestly, uh, at scale, you can probably just use Mural or Miro or one of these tools and maybe just have a wiki or a online spreadsheet. You don't... I, I'm, a, I'm a fan of the less... Uh, framework, large scale Scrum, Craig Larman and Bus Vode, who I've met both several times, and they've always said uh, avoid tools that have the word agile in its name. You know, J Jira claims to be an agile project management tool. Okay, sh get rid of it. Let's just go with something completely lightweight that we can do however we want with. Okay, well, yeah, I, I um, I've definitely used. Some very lightweight tools that I really enjoy. Tiny PM was one. Mm -hmm. um, Pivotal Tracker is another. Uh, yeah, and they just don't have all the the features that mm -hmm. these enterprise tools have. And there's just a beauty in the simpl simplicity, and the focus on the work, and everything else is the noise we can just. Leave. Well, and you being in Oz, you have to use Jira, right? That's the rule, isn't it? Uh, so I was I was doing a project, a CRM project for the University of New South Wales down in Sydney. And I was having a crack at Jira because I'm not a Jira fan. It's got a user interface its mother couldn't love. And I think I, I probably made that kind of comment. And uh, and the product who, owner who said, I think, audience? yeah, okay. she said, I think you better keep your voice down because the founders of Atlassian paid for the building that we're sitting in. Ouch. Uh, they, were, <laughs> they were former students at the university and, uh, and huge benefactors. So, um, yeah. I love that. <laughs> I, was, I was doing a conference talk somewhere. It's been 10 years ago, but I was talking about like tortoise SVN or something like that, some, some, uh, you know, Windows shell interface. I'm like, yeah, you could always download and install that. It works pretty well. And someone in the back row is like, you're welcome. You oh. know, the, the developer who built it was in the, in the talk that day. <laughs> Very cool. Kind of uh, fun. This is, this said something nice about it. <laughs> that always works. Yeah. I got lucky. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Richard, we, um, in the business apps community, we have a couple of challenges applying scrum that. I'm not, I'm not saying they're unique to business applications, but they're definitely quirks. And I'd, I'd love your perspective, having worked with hundreds or thousands of teams and professionals at, at this point. Um, the three, three challenges that I get asked about are, our product owner is a domain expert. It's somebody from sales or marketing or HR or operations. They're a manager or an executive. They've got the authority. They've got the vision. Uh, they understand the business processes and the existing systems. They're going to be a great product owner, except they've never been a product owner. They know nothing about software development. They have never heard of Scrum. How can we help them become great product owners? Uh, have you seen product owners in that sense work? Or is it better to go and find a career professional product manager who's done this lots of times before, who doesn't have maybe the domain expertise or knows the existing culture and people and, and politics? Which do you think makes a better Product owner. It's not that easy. Um, I, let me just tell you some experiences I've had. Product owners who are too technical, maybe they used to be developers or maybe they you know, created V1 of it and they want to hang around because it's still their baby. As long as you can keep them out of the code, if you can keep them focused on the what and stay out of the how, they can be successful. I like what you said, though, is the person you describe has, has vision and authority. Yeah. To me, that's that's table stakes for a product owner. You know, the whole organization's got to, you know, be believe in them and, and, and let them make their own decisions. So uh, the first two things sound pretty good to me. Now, if they're trying to push down, here's what I want and here's how I'd like you to do it, right. that gets to be you know, a problem. We like yeah. that fine separation of what and how. Um, I, I have worked with teams who, so quick story. Uh, it was a pharmaceutical company in Tucson, and they had 
they had nine product managers. They were client relations managers. They were building backend software for, you know, CVS, uh, Kroger's, uh, Albertsons, and, and of course, Walmart. So of the nine, there was, you know, wh whenever Walmart wanted something, they, they, they could literally stop the sprint. Walmart wants this, <laughs> you know, stop the sprint. This just became your priority one, you know, go do this. And, and everyone was like losing morale. So we needed, it was great because Lord of the Rings was popular at the time. So nine, then we called them the nine ring rates <laughs> and we needed to, to hire a product owner and give them the ring of power over those nine ring rates. And they, they, they literally went, I think it found some, some tester in the organization because testers had pretty good domain knowledge, didn't have any particular politics, didn't, you know, couldn't, couldn't be swayed by any of the nine ring wraiths. They right. gave them the backlog, they gave them authority, sent them to some, some scrum product owner training and, and, uh, you know, proceeded. Very cool. That's, uh, I, lo I love the analogy of the ring wraiths. Amazing. <laughs> okay. So, um, you reckon we can work with the, whoever's going to be in that hot seat as a product owner, teach them the scrum framework as we go along, help them understand empiricism yeah. and, and getting feedback. And, and, and you know, we, we changed roles to accountabilities in the last Scrum Guide. And people are like, w whatever, I'm still calling them roles. The, the big thing I've been explaining that to people is you can still call the person the product manager. You can still call the person Bob. It doesn't matter what their name or their title or their role is, but they do take on the accountability of maximizing the value of the product by the work of the Scrum team, you know, and, and other things like that. The voice of the stakeholders and, you know, right. And as long as the whoever whoever it is you're talking about has that um, mentality, then great. Yeah, technical skills. I don't think they need them. And no, I, I think it's better they, if they don't. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's better if they don't. Remember too, they don't have to be the one that writes the stories or drags the things around in Azure boards or does the typey typey. Uh, that can all be delegated, but the product owner is accountable for what's in there. Yeah, the the switch from roles to accountabilities. Um, threw me a little bit in 2020. Um, and it, it's mostly because not for product owners that, that, that fits really naturally as an accountability, mm -hmm. but it's mostly for scrum masters. Cause there is a lot of people with a job title of scrum master. Yeah. But, and, that, and that's maybe confusing and it's just, it's a byproduct of, of scrum having been around now for 20 years, mm -hmm. but I enjoy working with teams where one of the developers just stands up and say, Hey, you know what, for this next couple of releases, I'll fulfill that accountability and yep. I'll help facilitate the team. And I might have another accountability as a developer. And, you know, sometimes there's a bit of that, but um, the only issue you with don't that, have to be a career scrum master no, to hold that accountability. The only issue with that, I'm, I'm with you for years and years and years. I was like, just let one of the devs do it as a part-time thing. And Obviously, if, if any Scrum Mastery things pop up, that needs to take precedent over writing code or running tests or whatever. Except that it's very clear in the latest Scrum Guide that one of the accountabilities is to the organization. And I see this as lacking in a lot of Scrum teams. That Scrum Master there, you know, may locally optimize their Scrum team and get their product owner squared away and the developer squared oh. away and do a good job of, of being a, you know, a sheep dog, keeping the, the bad things away. But are they working with the organization to help them understand and enable empiricism? Are they working with the organization to, you know, lead workshops like, hey, we're doing Scrum now. What are your touch points? How does this change things? And if if you're if you're having a dev do part time Scrum master work, I don't know that they're going to even have time or interest no. or, you know, maybe they're not even extroverted enough to go in and talk to the bosses. So that's the only risk there is that the, the, the attention to the org might get missed if a dev's doing part-time scrum master abilities. Yep. All right, uh, it all, all makes sense. One of the other challenges that we have with business applications is this notion of a big bang release hmm. coming in to replace the Oracle or SAP accounting system, right? We wanna release iteratively and frequently into production and get feedback, mm -hmm. but my CFO is gonna crucify me if I try and replace accounts receivable this year and accounts payable next year, uh, that's not going to work. We're going to have to wait until both um, AR and AP are done yeah. um, before we can release. So we're going to have to package up bigger releases less frequently and, mm -hmm. and go live with those when it makes sense. But it might be a release every year, not every you know, other sprint. Is that an acceptable approach? 
can we still call ourselves a scrum team when we're doing reasonably large releases into production very infrequently? Um, as long as we're, for example, releasing into pre-production environment every other sprint to get that kind of feedback. What's your, what's your take on those big releases? Sure. I, I would say that I, I have a feeling that your executive is going to crucify you if it sucks, even though it's all released together. So True. you could get mini crucified along the way, or you could get majorly crucified <laughs> if the big bang sucks as well. Sucks is not a scrum term, by the way. <laughs> uh, so when you release, how often you release is not even part of scrum. There's nothing about release in the scrum guide. The closest we get is saying that the increment is potentially usable in software that's releasable, but it also doesn't exclude being released continuously. Finish a PBI, meet the definition of done, it goes to production, feature flagged off if you want. So yep. I would I would add, I don't I don't know enough of the technicals of what you do, but is it possible to feature flag things? Like it's deployed, but it's feature flagged so only 10% of the people, you know, the users that we trust that are in the beta test group see the new thing and everyone else sees the old workable thing. Yeah. We definitely have some challenges. Like if you're deploying a, a call center application mm -hmm. to give a, a new application to 10% of the call center operators is, is challenging because there are, you know, there's going to be business processes missing from the, mm -hmm. the, the uh, release one of the new application. And there's going to be integrations missing to other, you know, inventory systems or whatever else they need to do their jobs. So we have to try and balance it. And, and uh, certainly once we're in production, we can rapidly roll out new features, sometimes behind a flag or uh, with a security rule, say you don't have access to this until, you know, we've, we've given it, got some feedback from some users over here who have the appropriate security rule, who've got the new feature. Um, so we can do some of that stuff. Well, and Microsoft does that with the rings, you know, there's the ring, ring right. zero and ring one and ring two, and you can be, a, you can, you can opt into the early adopter rings and you know, if you've got that much time and patience, but sometimes things break, uh, you know, as well as I do, the only way scrum works is with feedback. So if, if you can, if you can still set it up in a way where maybe it's not released, but it's, but it's runnable in a test environment to where, you know, actual people can give you feedback on it, not just devs to, to each other, although that's valuable too. Um, then, I, you know, as long as you're taking that feedback and it's got close enough sample data to the real stuff, um, yeah, that might be as, as good as you can get. And then as the modules come online, then you can decide when you want to release them all together. But you know that they're, they meet the definition of done all along the way yep. and the feedback comes in and then your product owner can make the decision. Yeah, I think there's enough goodness in here to actually release it to production. I think it's ready. I'm switching gears a little bit. One of your, you're the co-creator of the Nexus uh, Scaled Scrum Framework. Mm -hmm. I've had to work in environments where we've had multiple teams. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes it's, my Dynamics 365 team. There's been a systems integration team building um, logic apps and all sorts of things to do integrations. Sure. Then there's been an, another vendor and another in, internal team doing something else. So three or four teams have got to coordinate all of our work. Nexus has been a, a blessing for, for coordinating that kind of work. We're nice. still, we're using, we're trying to use the Nexus framework, but not all of the teams are necessarily practicing Scrum. Uh, okay. Not all the teams are, are doing things the same way. For example, they get slightly different definitions of done. They got slightly different estimation methods. And th that was uh, a bit of a torture. But coming together um, in the, the Nexus integration team and applying those, those principles and a little bit of extra framework on top really helped us manage dependencies and map those and, and reduce them and nice. get more work done. Um, so tell me about the origins of the, of the Nexus Scaled Scrum framework and, sure. and where it's yeah. headed next. So prior to what the mid 2010s, uh, if you wanted to scale scrum, it was called the scrum of scrums and yep. most of the world got it wrong. They said that that's where the, the scrum masters get together and synchronize stuff. Uh, a good friend of mine, Charles Bradley, who I think I learned a lot of professional scrum ideas from him. He's actually over in uh, the Denver area. He did a blog post called the much maligned scrum of scrums. He revisited it and said, by the way, just like the daily scrum is for developers, the scrum of scrum is for developers and it's messy and it's technical and it's tactical and it's, it's not a status meeting. So, you know, all those things come out at scale. Uh, what was the origins of Nexus? Well, it was safe. I'll just be clear. 
oh. Scaled Agile Framework came out and Ken immediately saw it for what it was. Um, I'll let your listeners go and look for the article, Unsafe at Any Speed Yep, by Ken Schwaber. Uh, but essentially, um, it was anything but Agile. You know, here was one of the co-creators of RUP repackaging. Well, it is. It's just a rational unified process, a wolf in sheep's clothing, right? That's, that's what I think, too. I'm trying to be nice here. Uh, <laughs> but Ken saw it for what it was, a giant, you know, complex thing that cares more about alignment through all the programs and enterprise than it does about enabling the teams. Um, our answer, so, so we were, I forget what we were working on at the time at Scrum Org. Some, some, oh, I think it was the agility index and some of the EBM stuff, the early, early days of that. And we just put it, we, we put that on a shelf and we said, look, we got to come out with some, something. There's got to be a scrum.org answer to safe. And we started putting together this thing. Ken came up with the name Nexus, you know, an intercommunication pathways of communication with a bunch of people or things, which we didn't like the name because everything was called the Nexus. Google had a phone called the Nexus. Uh, my favorite Nexus reference reference is the, the the replicants in Blade Runner were called Nexus <laughs> Six. Uh, so anyway, if you look at if you look at the Nexus Scrum framework and kind of squint a little bit, it's just Scrum. You know, the the, the process model looks very much similar. We added uh, an extra event. You know, we made cross team refinement required because it's like you said the 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 purpose of scaling framework is to identify and address dependencies. It's not about getting your architectural epic runways aligned with your program level this to get your team level that, you know, no, it's just let's find these dependencies, which are killers at scale. And by the way, dependencies are not just technical dependencies. They could be people dependencies, domain experience dependencies. They could be, hey, team two doesn't have access to team three's repo you know, right. security dependencies, but, but light those things up and, and, and don't just stare at them, but, but mitigate them. So that's where our cross team refinement comes in. That's why we have, you know, the pre daily scrum. That's why we have the pre sprint retrospective and the post sprint retrospective so that we can do this bottom up intelligence. So as a nexus, as a team of teams, we can improve overall. And it's, it's pretty simple. It's just scrum. Nexus is just scrum. Yeah. Yeah. That's one I love about it. It's, um, I didn't have to learn anything new. I read the book and went, okay, we'll just add a, an extra ceremony here. We, we, we get technical people, like a representative from each of the team or a couple of people, um, maybe once or twice per sprint as often as we need to figure out what those dependencies are come up with a plan for mitigating them and getting rid of them, stick that thing in your product backlog and make sure you do that before next sprint. And when do you need that API? Okay. Well, we'll aim to have that done by sprint four so you can build the user interface on top of it and sprint five and we're all good. So. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny how many times I've flown across the country to just tell people to talk to each other. <laughs> it's like, well, we brought you in as a scrum expert. Tell us what we need to do. Well, why don't you get together and talk to each other? Brilliant. Thank you. You're worth the money. I'm like, all right, you're welcome. Great. Nexus is no different. Just talk to people at scale. Talk to the right people. And so when's the right time for a, a larger team to consider adopting some of the Nexus or, or, or not part of it, adopting Nexus? Is it when they're at that 10 people stage and they want to go faster and they want to grow the team beyond kind of 10 people? Okay, we're going to think about splitting the team. So our guidance is three teams or more. Right. Two, te two teams, they can just work and do a scrum of scrums, the proper way to do scrum of scrums and keep synchronized that way. The complexity starts to starts to hit at three teams. So Nexus is really intended for three to nine scrum teams working on the same product, one product backlog, one product owner. The, I, I sometimes get the opposite question, which is, hey, we've got 300 people in our, you know, Czech uh, development center. How do we bring the Nexus in there? I'm like, well, what, why are we starting with the number of people? Why don't we start right. with the products? What yeah. start? start with the product and go up, figure out the minimum we need because our number one rule of scaling meals, as you know, is don't scale. Yeah. Don't, don't scale. As soon as you add a second team, you're going to have friction. You're going to have these dependencies. Just, it's just natural. How much can so, you get done with a small team? Yeah. How much can you get done with a small team? And, and I, I propose if it's a professional scrum team that adheres to XP 
practices and you know what we call professional scrum developers you can get a lot done you can get a lot done um one of the, the challenges i've had with those kind of scaling situations is we we end up with teams of specialists like the example i just gave you where we had the dynamics 365 team the systems integration team and, and other teams of specialists maybe a, an erp team and we're now all completely dependent upon each other Whereas if we'd organize ourselves into three mixed teams mm -hmm. and set up some different boundaries and said, oh, you work on this module or, or that domain and we'll work on this one, we probably would have been able to go a lot quicker. But it felt very unnatural for us to mix people with completely different technical backgrounds together in, in one team. Um, yeah. And you, you might have seen it in, in the kind of classic software development. You've got a front end team and a middleware layer oh, sure. team and, and, a, yeah. and a database team. And it just doesn't work, right? You better to take a, a vertical sliced team. We've got all the skills to take a, an idea into production. Uh, oh, quick I story. Think, um, yeah. I was brought into a online travel company uh, in Bellevue, Washington. I can't mention the name, but they're one of the <laughs> three. And spun out from Microsoft. I, I, uh, yeah, Microsoft paid me to go in there because I was the TFS expert. And all I, all I know is I'm supposed to go in there and help them with their source control and, and help speed things up a bit. And in, in the morning introduction, the room was crammed. There was like 30 people in there. And they're like, well, Richard, we understand you're the expert. Here's the problem. Uh, any like new feature that wants to go into our website, like if we just want a button that when you click it, it says, hello world, it takes 47 days from the green light to production. I said, why does it take so long? Well, it's got to go to the front end team and then to the data team and then to the security team and the web team. And, you know, this, I, I picture back to Lord of the Rings, you know, the, the, the fellowship moving through all these lands and through these tunnels and getting to Mordor or whatever and throw it in the volcano. I said, I said, and then, oh, 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 oh. And we were told that you could come in here and introduce a branching strategy that would get this down to seven days. <laughs> And I said, wait, so first of all, in my head, I'm thinking, okay, you're telling me the what and the how, why am I even here? Just go do a branching strategy. But I, I room full of people. I said, that's going to take it to 67 days. You want to go down, right? If you want to get single digit cycle time, you need to rearrange your teams. You need fun. You need feature teams. Take one web person, one security, one data da, 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 and put them on a team. Give that team some generic name, like the Avengers right? Give them some authority, give them all the passwords, all the systems that they need. Don't require them to play politics. Now you can get hello world out the door in seven days or less. And, and like everyone in the room, Neil was like pretzeling up, like this guy just recommended me losing my head count. <laughs> so yeah, but, but that's the answer. Make things less complex and you need right. less teams. It's, I think it's tough though that those organizational boundaries are are you know built of solid concrete often and they're hard to break down hard um, to break down yeah yeah uh, uh, yeah larman craig larman has got larmanslaws.org you should check it out sometime but it's essentially if if you as a consultant or a coach or agile transformation specialist whatever that means come into an organization uh the the, the resistance you will meet is enormous because you're talking to the people whose jobs are in peril. You're talking to the middle managers who may not have a future in a truly self-managing scrum of scrums or scrum teams. And then if you can, if you can get by that, they'll essentially say, yeah, we like that. And they'll, they'll just take the nouns, but they'll, they'll ignore the verbs you're bringing in. They'll say, okay, well, we'll call <laughs> this person, the scrum master. We'll call that person the da -da -da -da, which is kind of what safe does, right? It gives the existing people new names. It's like Oprah, you get a name and you get a title <laughs> and you get a new role. Uh, if, if they're okay with the, with the nouns and, and the verbs, then those, those people that, that used to be there, they'll, they'll come back up as agile coaches or they'll, they'll be part of the transformation so that once you're gone, they can slowly, you know, subvert back to the way it was. Yeah. Good stuff. Richard, um, just before we, we close, I'd be interested sure. to get your thoughts on, on what's next with Scrum. Jeff and Ken have, have carried the baton for a long time. Um, we had the last uh, iteration of the Scrum Guide in December 2020. Uh, here we are in 2023. I'm not sure if there's another version planned or what might be in it. Um, I, I really like some of the changes that have been made over the last couple of years. Where do you think it's headed next? 
well, Scrum, the framework itself, you know, the empirical process control nature of Scrum hasn't changed since the beginning. They might have changed a few nouns or changed a few numbers, roles to accountabilities. It's essentially the same today as it was in the original vision of Jeff and Ken, which was just their kind of repackaging of the new, new product development game, you know, for software. And that's great. You know, stand on the shoulder of giants and keep moving. I just uh, wish um, yeah. Nanaki and Tanaka, who, who wrote that paper, um, knew a little bit more about rugby <laughs> because Jeff and Ken picked it up and they don't know much about rugby either. <laughs> but uh, there's a whole bunch of rugby metaphors in there that uh, don't. Scrum is not when a, a team is aligned and carries the ball up the field. It's a very contentious head to head clash to, to restart the ball after a set piece. Um, <laughs> so, anyway. So, on that, if you have a moment, I want to run my definition of Scrum by you. See if, right. see if, it, if it jives with somebody who actually lives in a country where scrum is or rugby is played. And I don't know where I picked this up, but let me just, let me just read this to you. I actually read this to my class. Um, okay. The, the fat guys all run into each other while the slightly slimmer guys stand in a line watching them. Eventually the fat guys get tired and have a lie down on top of each other. The ball comes out the back of this lie down and the skinnier guys kick it back and forth to each other for like half an hour. <laughs> then the fat guys wake up again and start running around in each other again. Every now and then the referee stops play because someone dropped the ball and turns out that's the only thing you're not allowed to do in rugby. Everything else seems to be okay. Sometimes one group of fat guys pushes the other group over the line and there's some manly hugging. No shifting or changing sides like in soccer though. And then after 80 minutes, they add up the score and New Zealand wins. <laughs> that's pretty close. Uh, that's pretty except... Close. Okay. You can drop the ball and it doesn't necessarily count as a foul as long as the ball goes backwards. It's only if the ball goes forwards um, that it's oh, wow. uh, it's not allowed. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I do know some pretty large, I'm not going to call them fat guys, I'm going to call large rugby players who, if they live in Boise, Idaho, boy, you're, you're in trouble. Um, oh, I know. Yeah. I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say they're fat to their face, but you know, <laughs> it's all muscle, I'm sure. Uh, yeah, it's uh, and if you just did, did that whole thing with pads and helmets, it's a pretty good approximation of football, right? So. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> I suppose so. Um, back to your question, though, what's what's next? Scrum is a really, as you know, it's a really good framework within which a team can try things. So I, I, there might not be anything new coming with Scrum, but there's going to be, you know, a parade of complementary practices, some technical, some people, soft skills that that are that are showing up you know, mobbing, for example, or a hypothesis driven development. DevOps has given us, you know, sort of an appetizer platter of things to try on a scrum team. You know, I, I'm a fan of Jez Humble and Gene Kim and I read their books and there's some cool things in there. Uh, They're the Phoenix project guys. Yeah. Phoenix project, yep. uh, the DevOps handbook, the, all of that, the, so I don't know what next for scrum. Um, I, I do know like from scrum.org, we are mindful of the community and, you know, we are trying to answer the calls for help that we see managers, you know, trying to give them, you know, some, some hope like, Hey, you need to, you know, refactor your thinking into how I can become a capability manager and maybe an impediment remover, but we don't need Tayloristic managers anymore. So maybe some training around that. And, and uh, you know, they shouldn't be standing there with a clipboard wondering what your velocity was last sprint. And, uh, you know, yeah. I quite often find, particularly in larger teams where there's maybe two or three scrum teams, that we're still looking for somebody to take hold of um, systemic risks, contract management, uh, vendor management, resource management, you know, getting doing hiring and, and that kind of stuff, and uh, looking after the budgets. And, and what we end up doing is say, hey, that sounds a lot like a classical project manager kind of responsibility. Exactly. Why don't we go and find ourselves a project manager to support our scrum teams? And it's worked really well for me. I, I kind of keep it secret because, you know, um, project managers and scrum sometimes have a bit of a contentious relationship. But I love it. I think there's a great role for project managers to support us and, yeah. and maintain their professional integrity. They're, they're great at that kind of stuff and, and communicating plans and schedules back out to the organization. Um, sure. As long as they I can let too. go of the command and control, assigning things and, and telling people what to do, 
Um, it's worked really well. Have you seen that work in other organizations? Have they kept on a project manager to, to, to assist um, the scrum teams? I, I have. I, I have heard of the shifts. You know, they still have a PMO, but they're an agile PMO, which here's the thing is everyone can say we're an agile PMO, but until you're an invisible person standing there watching how they work sprint after sprint, you don't really know if they're agile or not. The proof's in the pudding. If they're truly hands off, like you're suggesting, I'm, I'm a fan. I think, uh, again, I go back to what Craig says. I think for every 100 developers, you know, so what that 10, 15 scrum teams or more, you need one manager. And that manager is not a traditional manager with the clipboard, like you're saying, but they're, they're a capability manager. They're a capability builder. What can I do? How can I help? What, what new things do you need? Let me see your list of impediments that I can maybe help, help remove. Right. Um, let me go get some more budget. Uh, I'm kind of naive in my thinking about budgeting, but gosh, it's pretty simple. You've got a scrum team. You know what the run rate is. It's going to be the same this year as next year, you know, plus, plus any overhead that might change. Just fund the team and keep their backlog fed with high quality work. And you, have to, you don't have to do any projects anymore. Just fund the teams yep. and then trust the product owners. Yeah. Um, that's the way I like to think about it is, you know, how much does this thing cost? Well, we think it's going to last, you know, about a year and a half to get from here to here. Uh, and it's going to cost $75,000 a sprint. And after that, 90% of the value that you think you need today will have been delivered. And then you can go for a $10,000 per sprint um, team. You know, yeah. Skinny it down, do do okay. less stuff. Um, but But don't think of it as a, project that is concluded because it's a product that lives forever until you replace it with whatever's next. Um, yeah. Getting out well, of that. Yeah. That's, that's what, yeah. that's the shift in thinking that needs to happen. If you can get yeah. project managers that can see that vision, you know, think of value instead of scope, schedule, cost, then uh, yeah, you're in a good spot. Good stuff. Richard, it's been a fascinating conversation. I've really enjoyed having you on. Hopefully we'll get you back onto the show one day. Um, sure. Until then, where can people follow you, find out more, um, You've got a, an amazing book on Amazon. It's a professional scrum development with Azure DevOps. Yep. Um, how many buzzwords can you cram into a book title? That's an amazing job. Well, let me tell you, this was the first book I've written where I didn't stick a version number in the title. So this actually might live for a while. Uh, my last book was professional scrum development with Visual Studio 2012. I think oh, it was the okay. only time ever Microsoft had a version for one year. So by the time the thing kept, came out, it was 2013. <laughs> and I was already outdated. So uh, LinkedIn is good. Um, I'm, I'm not doing much on Twitter these days, but LinkedIn, I'm always, you know, getting into conversations about Scrum or Agile practices and, you know, uh, talking about the Nexus or telling people they're wrong, which <laughs> kind of is a hobby of ours sometimes. Oh, and there was this, this, this guy from Oz that was talking about all these great kinds of tests that they run on their product. And uh, I gave that my endorsement as well couple days ago you might share that thank you very much yeah um it's, yeah i really enjoy our, our interactions on linkedin so thank you for that i'll make sure your linkedin uh, profile and everything's in the show notes um, and people can grab a copy of your great as well um thanks richard appreciate you and uh, uh thanks very much for joining us appreciate you neil scrum on thanks to my guest richard hundhausen it was a blast meeting you richard and chatting with you and i hope we get to do it again sometime soon thanks to you too for joining me on another amazing applications adventure if you enjoyed this episode, head on over to the customary company page on LinkedIn, where you'll find a post for this episode. Remember to follow the page and please leave a comment on the post and let Richard know what you learned. Check out the show notes at amazingapps.show slash 136 for links to Richard's social media pages, the Nexus Scaled Scrum Framework, and his book, Professional Scrum Development with Azure DevOps. I've got more solo and guest episodes in the pipeline. I hope you can join me again. Don't forget to subscribe or follow the show in your favorite podcast app. Until then, keep sprinting.